Welcome to this new episode of Ask Stagup, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I'm Lisa Gannon, and I'm very glad to be here again to host this episode. Today, we are kicking off our second series of season four with three episodes detailing the more technical aspects in the laboratory. As a first subject, we would like to answer the questions we're sometimes getting from the field on limits of detection and quantitation. What's the difference between the two? How are they determined? And how are they useful? These questions around detection and quantification can sometimes be tricky to understand. And this is why we have a specialist with us today, Florence Crepe. Florence, you are an R&D manager at Stago and you and your teams are involved in the assessment of limit of blank detection and quantitation for our assays. The information we provide in our package insert or registration files derive from the experiments done in your laboratories. So you really know the subject. Hello, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me with you on this podcast. Hello, Florence. It's a pleasure. As you know, we like to start our episodes with some basic definitions. So to start with, can you tell us what are the limits of detection and quantitation? Of course, but to understand these limits, we must start a step ahead and talk about limit of blank. Limit of blank is, in simple terms, the blank of the method, meaning the signal you can have where there is no analyte in the sample. To be more precise, this is the measurement result likely to be observed when a blank sample containing no analyte is tested. So when you say likely, Florence, I have the feeling that statistics are involved here. Yes, Lisa. Likely takes into account some probability. LOB is determined considering several replicate measurements performed on a blank sample. 95% of measurement results of blank sample fall at or below the LOB. So what is the limit of detection then? Again, I will try to explain it first in simple terms. Limit of detection is the lowest quantity of analyte that the method is able to detect. But at this level, the method does not allow to quantify precisely the analyte. In other words, you are able to say there is some analyte, but you can't say what quantity exactly. In more statistical wording, it is the lowest concentration of analyte that can be consistently detected in 95% of cases. 95 when you choose a alpha risk of 5%. It is sometimes also called detection limit or minimum detectable concentration. Mm, Which brings us to limit of quantitation. The limit of quantitation is the lowest quantity of analyte that can be detected and quantified. So you are able to say there is some analyte and I can't say how much. We estimate that we can quantify when the quantity of analyte is at a level where the accuracy of the method is acceptable. The level of accuracy acceptability has to be defined previously from the LOQ determination. So if I summarize then, the limit of blank is the highest value we can obtain when measuring a blank sample, whilst the limit of detection is the lowest concentration that can be distinguished from a blank. And the limit of quantitation is the lowest concentration from which the measurement is accurate enough. Enough meaning with a pre-established level. Exactly, Lisa. You have it. Florence, I've heard you saying replicate measurements several times uh, in your previous answer. I know it relates to the actual procedure to determine the limits, both the testing procedure and the statistics behind that. Can you explain further how the limits we're talking about today should be assessed? So maybe we could start with the limit of blank? I admit I am used to drawing things, so in the podcast format, it is more challenging for me. I can imagine. LOB is determined on each type of instrument that can be used for the assay procedure. It is done using several blank samples, usually four or five, in order to account for matrix variability among samples, and several lots of reagents, at least three. Each sample is then measured 
four or five times per day on three different days to achieve a total of 60 replicates for each slot and instrument combination. The calculation of LOB depends on the result distribution, either it is normal or not normal. You can find the details about the calculations in CLSI's EP17A2. The final LOB for the essay, so the claim one, is the highest determined LOB from all combinations tested. So I have to ask then, Florence, what are those blank samples? So for anticoagulation assays, we can anticipate samples from individuals without treatment. But what about coagulation factor, plasma coagulation inhibitors, or even D-dimer assays? When we can't use patient plasma, the preferred option is to purchase depleted samples. These are depleted through adsorption or immune depletion. But you may also consider using the assay diluent, provided you have checked the diluent as similar behavior to a patient sample through linearity, recovery, or other assays. The zero calibrator is also sometimes a good option. Actually, in hemostasis, we are often obliged to use the zero calibrator or diluent because access to totally depleted samples is not that easy. And now we know our limit of blank. How do we proceed to determine the limit of detection or the LOD? We follow the same approach for the number of lots of regions and combinations of regions and instruments. But this time, the samples tested are low-level samples, meaning samples containing an analyte in a small concentration close to the assumed LOD. This assumed LOD is usually estimated as a range of one to five times to the estimated LOB. Ideally, we use patient plasma. If it's not possible, we can prepare low-level samples from, for example, dilution of a titrated patient plasma in a sample free from analyte or in the zero calibrator or in diluent. If dilution is not possible, we can also prepare spiked samples. Again, the objective is to get 60 determinations per reagent and instrument combination. And from these 60 measurements, how do you calculate the LOD itself? Well, again, it will depend on the result distribution. If all sample results display homogeneous variances or not, if I want to be really accurate. If variances over the samples are homogeneous, then LOD equals to LOB to which we had a portion of the variability observed on LOD determinations. So this is also what was summarized by David Armbruster and Terry Pry in their publication on the matter in 2008. Yes, Lisa. But sometimes variances are heterogeneous, and then the world's LOD assessment will require additional study that I won't develop here today. All details are described in cell size AP70A2. Okay, thank you, Florence, to make it a little bit lighter for myself and, of course, our audience. So about the limit of quantitation then, from what you explained to us in the first part of the podcast, I assume then that the key question is the predefined acceptable accuracy. This is completely true. And the predefined acceptable accuracy will depend on the approach we choose, knowing that there are two methods to calculate limit of quantitation. Either you go for total error, the preferable methods applying the Vesgard principle. It considers bias and precision to determine when the accuracy is acceptable. Or you go for the approach called functional sensitivity, which considers only precision error. This functional sensitivity approach is the fallback if no bias can be defined. So the first and most crucial step is to predefine the accuracy of the methods which is considered to be acceptable to quantify the analyte and which depends on the approach chosen. Then we prepare at least four low-level samples with an analyte concentration close to the expected LOQ. This expected LOQ is usually based on previous assays. These low-level samples are then tested with the evaluated methods and with the reference methods, 
if the reference method is available, of course. The difference between results obtained with the evaluated methods and the reference methods will allow to calculate bias error for each sample. The measurements with the evaluated methods are multiplied around 60 measurements per reagent and instrument combination, and it will allow the calculation of the precision error for each sample. LOQ is then the highest concentration from which either the total error or the functional sensitivity is meeting the predefined accuracy criteria. Wow, so many replicates in, in total. I think we can say that this type of experiment is very thorough and requires a high level of organisation. So Florence, we've talked a lot about the definition and practical determination of LOB, LOD and LOQ. Our final set of questions are then going to be around the utility of this kind of data. Well, from their definitions, I think it is pretty clear. Take the example of one anticoagulant drug level. LOD defines the lowest concentration you can detect in the sample with your assay procedure. So again, a small quantity, but not quantified quantity. The LOQ is the level from which the assay is able to give an exact quantity of anticoagulant present. And I suppose that sometimes LOD and LOQ are equal, but sometimes not. This is exactly it. It really depends on the assay accuracy and the predefined criteria for being accurate enough. It is important to note that LOQ can be equal to or greater, but never lower than the LOD. Hmm. So if I compare it to getting my eyesight checked, for example, at the ophthalmist, LOD is then when I start seeing some letters, but for example, could mix up the O and the D, whilst LOQ is from where I can clearly distinguish the two. Yes, this is another translation. What is important to remember, and your example explained it correctly, Lisa, is that the ESA can provide results from the LOD. And depending on the context, the level of information might be enough. This is the same as biological results, which are only meaningful with patients' clinical context. And does the assay analytical measuring ranges start from LOD or LOQ? can be both, depending again on what you are aiming at. And the state linearity experiments have to be taken into account too. Linearity experiments allow also to determine the upper limit of the analytical measuring range. Florence, we're reaching the end of our episode. What would you like our listeners to keep in mind from our discussion today? Maybe that they should not fear too much when talking about LOD and LOQ. But at the opposite, don't overlook the extensive work done by manufacturers to determine them as precisely as possible. Even if sometimes you need to redefine them to fit the laboratory accreditation criteria. And keep in mind that prior work is to define appropriate samples and how you will prepare these. Define the total error or analytical sensitivity criteria for LOQ and define the reference methods to use for LOQ and etc. But preparation really is key. Mm. Thank you so much, Florence, for this conclusion. It's amazing how you made these limit of detection and quantitation elements so clear for us today. And thanks to you all for listening as well. As usual, all literature sources and links to previous podcasts are listed in the podcast description box. And please feel free to send us any questions that you may have at our email address, ask at stago.com. And we'll be happy to address any questions in our following episodes. So see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.